This is one of the more intriguing ones here. This comic here is about a juxtaposition between 1950s comic was written in 1954. 1950s America in the distant past. Maybe 1700s. We have street, electric street lamps, signs, a car, policemen from two separate, uh, two centuries apart. Just general nightlife where um, the only glow you typically have unless you had a couple candles and lanterns on the streets would be coming from the actual buildings themselves casting a glow onto the street which is aside from typical small areas of town downtown town centers would be poorly paved if at all have potholes poorly drained i remember reading that uh Towns in general, places of denser populations prior to the invention in, of in infrastructure of drainage, plumbing, septic, sewage systems, smelled really bad. Not only did you have horses being the main means of transportation, and of course horses have digestive systems that work uh, constantly all throughout the city. But you had no means of disposing of waste from all the buildings, too. So in a lot of cases, you had people just simply throwing their waste out on the street to uh, be washed away by Mother Nature. So that seems pretty, yeah, pretty hard to imagine living in, in that existence. So let's take an adventure into the past. The more you learn about the past, the more you not only appreciate what you have, but that appreciation leads to actual joy in just using everyday items. Hot showers, cool air in hot climates, warm air in cold climates. I mean, think about the technology of clothing. This sweater here is really comfortable. And the, the, the knitting, the embroidery are whatever you call it, the, the fabric is really finely woven together. And everything we have is so much better in almost any metric than the past. So let's find out what, how great we really have it here. So it opens up, I think, with another movie here. Okay, this is colonial America, right around the time of the American Revolution, early 1700s. Yippee, said the guy on the horse. We've beaten the Redcoats. Williamsburg is saved. And the movie says it's about a romance. <laughs> Looks like you have Johnny and his lady friend being chaperoned, maybe, by Johnny's older brother. Johnny says, gee, what a movie. I could see it all over again. So could I, Johnny. It was super. Johnny says, the boy was just about my age, and look at all the adventures he had. The girl says, I like the girl best, especially her clothes. My, colonial times were romantic, weren't they, Ed? Ed says, Johnny's older brother, Say, how would you like to travel a couple hundred years into the past and see for yourselves? W what? H how can we? Suppose you two started back in for a vacation trip and leave the rest to me. Soon, Johnny, Jane, and Ed are on their way into the past. I know we're heading south, but where? To the same Williamsburg we saw in the movie, of course. The Cradle of American Liberty. In the 1700s, 
When it was Virginia's capital, patriots like Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, and George Washington lived and worked there. Here it is, Colonial Williamsburg, restored and built just as, as it was 200 years ago. Look, hoop skirts in a stagecoach. The wonderful sights of Williamsburg. I'm sure GE has a plant or something around here. This is the House of Burgess, where America's oldest lawmaking body met. The 13 colonies met here. On this spot, Patrick Henry spoke out for liberty. In the 18th century in Virginia, misbehaving citizens were locked in a pillory in front of the public goal, gowl. Guide to Colonial Williamsburg. Williamsburg's citizens celebrated important occasions and holidays at their favorite Raleigh Tavern. In the ballroom of the Governor's Palace, Governor's Palace, traveling dancers, dancing masters taught the latest steps from England. This is just a general setup, I guess, to the the environment here, setting the scene before they go ahead and compare technology, two separate centuries, I guess society too, technology and how it um, affects our daily lives, two centuries apart. Here the uh, George White House, a typical town residence of a well-to-do gentleman, as you see almost all of the housework Household work was done in separate buildings on the estate. And thus, the home was really a group of small workshops where slaves and servants labored. The kitchen, the laundry, the smokehouse, the residence, the main residence there, weaving, I don't know what necessary means, tough coat, chicken house, lumber house. Johnny says, now I know what they mean by the good old days. I wish I could have lived here. Must have been fine. <laughs> it wasn't. Not even for the few wealthy plantation owners. You see, 200 years ago, most folks had to work long and hard days for a simple existence. Just close your eyes, Johnny and Jane, and try to imagine how different your lives would have been if you were a colonial boy and girl in Williamsburg two centuries ago, I guess maybe this is seven o'clock in the evening, the guys lighting the candles, street lanterns. And now uh, here we go, we have a juxtaposition between what a day would be like. The daily activities and the technologies you'd use across the two centuries. You'd be awakened at dawn, cold and sleepy. Jonathan, you better lie in bed, you... You got a busy day ahead. Brr, someday I shall be frozen solid. They still had kind of an English accent back then, right? But now today, you not only get up later, but even on the coldest mornings, you're snug and warm. Taking a hot shower. Having hot air. Fill the house with heat. A simple colonial breakfast now took time and patience to prepare in the open fireplace. Will that porridge ever be hot, mother? One thing at a time, lad. There's tea to be brewed as well. Nowadays, many and plenty of good things to eat are stored cool and clean, prepared quickly and easily. Oh, boy. The breakfast of athletes 
orange juice, waffles, and bacon and toast. Just save room for these hot biscuits. <laughs> so they got soup having to be heated over an open fireplace or porridge. And they gotta use that same fire to heat up the tea if they already have water in the house, if they don't have to fetch it. Hmm. No microwave, no toaster, no ovens. I mean, I guess they didn't even have microwaves in the contemporary, the current modern setting. But uh, they still had lots of pre, you know, prepared meals, uh, ingredients in the fridge. Every morning, water and firewood had to be brought by to the house by manpower and boy power. Here's enough wood to last through the day. And now, time to start work, Jonathan. Well, these trips aren't exactly play, are they? No chores for us. We'll just take fuel and water for granted as part of our home. <laughs> Johnny, turn up the thermostat, would ya? On your way out? Come along, son. I'll drop you off on my way. All right, Dad. It's long, Mom. Wish me luck. As she's got her kitchen mixer, her coffee pot, and the toaster right there. Her electric clock. Only the wealthy could afford an education. Most people had neither the time nor the money. Boy, I want you to forge me a pair of door hinges of these dimensions. Sorry, sir, but neither my father nor I have learned to read. Then in the modern times, but today all boys and girls have time for school. And education is free for everybody. In classroom, this is how Volta built his first battery, according to the book I read yesterday about famous electrical pioneers. Learning a trade was a colonial lad's all-day job. I know you're tired, son, but we must keep the fire going if we're going to finish these hinges on time. Well, three o'clock these days is fun time for you kids. Touchdown. Hooray for Johnny Power. Golly, not even be able to, not even able to read slaving all day long. That was tough. Imagine the slaves, Johnny. It couldn't be helped in those days, Johnny. But Ed, what about the women and the men? What was their day like? Well, well, a girl had to help her mother with her dawn-to-dark labor. There was the laundry, for instance. The lady saying, scrub the clothes well, Jane, but be sparing of the soap. We shall have to make more soap soon, Mother. Yeah, think about that. They had to make their own soap. From animal fat. Today, while you're at school, now in the present, or 1950s, Mother's automatic washer soaks, washes, rinse, rinses, and dries everything for her, while her automatic ironer saves her still more time and energy. <laughs> Did they have washers and dryers in one? I wonder when, when that's going to happen. I don't think I've ever seen that. Then there was the matter of the house cleaning. I've spread the clothes on the grass to dry. On the grass, wow. That's a good child. Now while you repeat the rugs, I'll finish sweeping and start the windows. 
Now electric appliances, like a staff of well-trained servants, do our cleaning. Oh, Joni's from a, still from a well-to-do family, I see. There, the rogue spick and span. Oh, I guess she might still have an accent, too. I don't know. Pins. Think, think I'll do the upholstery today, too. Then, when the housework was done, it's only two hours to dinner. We'd best get started, Jane. <laughs> no big deal. Just a daily two-hour... two-hour chore to make dinner. I'll start the bread. Start my bread and you fetch some dried beef and potatoes from the cellar. With today's electric range, refrigerator, and home freezer, the mother can prepare tasty and healthful meals in a matter of minutes. Twenty minutes to dinner time. Now let's see lamb chops, green salad, strawberries. This will taste so good. They'll never know it's full of vitamins A to double C. <laughs> okay. Yeah, health nut. Um... Since in those days, there were only crude tools and muscle power, boys had to help their fathers with the heavy work. Good, Jonathan. You'll make a fine smith someday. A different story for our day, eh, Johnny? Machinery makes his job a lot easier. And this electric-powered machine costs $17,000, so take good care of it. Look at her cutting right through that steel like a knife through cheese. At the forge, long after nightfall. Whew, I'm worn out and thought the day would never end. We did a day, a proud day's work, son. A pair of hinges in one day. Think about that. At the factory, it's still daylight when work ends. Quite a producer, that machine of yours, Powers. Here she turned out 2,000 parts today. More power to her. The more she turns out, the cheaper completed products will be for us to buy. Gosh, we seem sort of lazy compared to them, don't we? Not at all. Remember, modern tools and power do things better and faster than our own hands and give us time for other things. Guess those folks didn't feel like the other things when their work was done, did they? It's true. Didn't have much leisure activity back then, huh? After dinner, it was bedtime for those weary folks. Oh dear, I've not finished mending, but the candle's flickering out, Jonathan, off to bed with you. I'm going, mother, yawn, yawn. Well, nowadays our evening, our evening is just beginning. All right, we'll be late for the eight o'clock show. What's the rush, as long as we can catch the newsreel? I can take it. No, I take it all back. You can keep the good old days. I'll stick to the good old today. Got a picture of them bowling, picnicking, having coffee in front of the TV, playing cards under AC and evening electric light bulbs. When we've... When... We have time and energy for hobbies and sports and reading and entertainment and enjoying life. Don't think that the Williamsburg folks didn't want a better life, Johnny, but today's good things just didn't exist then. And the people lived pretty much the way their ancestors did before them. Of course, there were many improvements from century to century, but as strange as it seems...
the means on which they depend they depended for light for heat travel and power they hadn't changed much since the beginning of man the only lighting was an open flame the only heat an open fire and the best travel and communication depended on horsepower and power meant the working man, for the working man meant muscle, muscle power. But since these were the only methods they had ever known, colonial folks just took them for granted. Just think about the slow transformation. You did pretty much, you were guaranteed from the day you are born to have to do what your parents did. That's, um, it hadn't changed for millennia. It's always been that way. In technology, we expect revolutionary technologies every 10 years now. Back then, you expected it maybe every 50, maybe a, maybe 100. I don't know. You thought in terms of generations multiple generations but think about living think about living exactly like your grandparents did nothing had really changed maybe you got a you know your um, I don't know the style of your curtains or fabric might have slightly changed but really you all sat in front of an open fire, read by candlelight after dark, heated yourself up, warmed, dried your clothes by fire. You all traveled by horseback. No technological advantage or progress over centuries. That's, uh, that's really it. Just as we take today's wonders for granted and comforts, the click of a switch that floods the night light, the night with daylight, the instant heat at our fingertips, the high-speed travel and split-second communication that really made the world small, huh? And the miracles that power-driven machines have brought in our factories and our homes. Well, gee, Ed, how did such a big change and such a fast one come about? <laughs> That's a story in itself, Johnny. A story of a revolution. With soldiers and machine guns? A revolution, all right, but a peaceful one, Jane. With men and machines. It was called the Industrial Revolution. Remember how it took Jonathan's father hours and days of hard work and muscle to produce something? Until the late 1700s, James Watt's steam engine opened the way to a new source of power at last. Result? With steam engine power, many men could do much more work with much less effort in a single factory instead of many forges. Instead of many forges. Also in those days, every part of a musket, for instance, was handmade and therefore different. It was just impossible to make any two parts alike, so you couldn't just buy modular pieces that perfectly were interchangeable if your musket broke, you had to have one custom made, and that was expensive and costly and time-consuming, until Eli Whitney and the inventor of the cotton gin worked out the ideal, the idea of identical parts. All gun barrels made from the same pattern will fit any stock made from this one. And so we had interchangeable parts 
and could mass produce for the first time. The late 1800s. Another thing, the blacksmith had to be able to turn out many different products, and boys like Jonathan had to spend many years learning the difficult trade. But identical parts soon led to another way of improving production. Now we can have a number of workmen, each with one, each one a specialist in making a single part. More efficient, but a lot more boring. A lot more monotonous. With specialization, each man could become skilled at his job in a few weeks, work easier and faster, and be finished. And the finished product was not only better, but cheaper. The brazing department, assemb assembly department, the lathe and casting departments, that way. All the men coming to work in their factory, going to their separate departments, their separate specialties. At the forge, there was much lifting and carrying of heavy loads, until in the factory, this guy says, if we set up a moving belt line to carry parts, it'll mean easier work for the men as well as more production. And so... The assembly line was born. Then we were on our way to the modern factory system. What do you mean, on our way, Ed? Because the Industrial Revolution itself could be revolutionized. In the late 1800s, new force was put to work in our homes and factories. A new force. What was that force? Electricity. Electric power, electric generators, machines, tools changed our factories from dirty, cluttered, sometimes dangerous places. We had to be located in where they could produce their own coal or water power to clean, bright, efficient, steam, streamlined manufacturing plants. Yeah, I didn't think about that either. If they were using wind or water, even coal had to be shipped a long ways and that would increase the cost of it. Now it could be located anywhere drawing the power from a vast 300,000 mile network of high voltage electricity. Electricity not only revolutionized the way we make things, but the things we made too. To give us the highest living standard, standard of living in the world. It's true, I think post-war post-World War II, uh, America in the 1950s and 60s was the highest standard of living in the world. Sure, because with electric machinery, workmen can produce more, and the more he produces, the cheaper the products get. And because they're cheaper, more people can buy them. Which brings us right back again more and better things for all of us, in our homes, for instance. And here we got a typical home here, 1950s America. The kitchen. Electric power has made life easier, more enjoyable, for, more complete for all of us. Dishwasher with an electric disposal, refrigerator, toaster, thermostat, Appliances, uh, you know, mixers and ranges, ovens, um, probably hood vents, a freezer in the back room, radio, television, phonograph, telephone, centrally located, a clock, lamps, an electric fan, electric blanket, whoa. Electric power has become as common as water to us. 
ready and waiting to flow whenever and wherever we need it. And how about outside our homes, Ed, like in cars and ships and planes and trains? And how about the movies? And the x-ray doctors and dentists use? And almost everything. Now, just a flip of a switch, or just a push of a button, and electricity brings us light and heat and power. Golly, we've sure come a long way. Since Williamsburg, we've got everything. I don't know, Johnny. Folks a hundred years from now may look back at us the way we look back at Williamsburg. Yes, Jane, inventive industry today is working harder than ever to bring us wonderful new things of tomorrow. Gosh, it takes all kinds of people to make a country like ours, folks like us, workers, inventors, scientists, businessmen. We've all had a hand in making this country great. America was built by people with ideas and a will to get things done. Gee whiz. Nice little dose of patriotism to round out the comic here. Love it. And that was really fun. That was a, a rip-roaring good time, guys. I hope you all had a, had a heck of a good time as well. Think about 1955, 1954, exactly 70, 70. Seventy years ago, yeah. That's right. Well, seventy years ago. What do you guys think? How far have we come since old Johnny and Jane? Now here's the story of light. And this is more, it's kind of along the same lines. It's really just, uh, again, a historical walk through the, um, through the uh, evolution of what eventually became the modern again at this time, incandescent light bulb, 1957. This is before fluorescent lights, which work, f do use electricity, but they work from a different principle, a photochemical principle where you stimulate the powder inside, and as it drops back down, as the electrons that are stimulated drop back down, they release light. And I think it's actually a two-phase, a two-stage, two-step um, process where there's chemicals that are stimulated directly by the electricity and those give off high-energy ionizing UV light that ionize the um, other chemicals inside the the um, fluorescent light tubes and it's that second ionized chemical that I forget what it is that actually releases the invisible light that we that we know of as the white cold fluorescent lighting so let's read the story of light here and then after that we're going to get into the um, electricity around us which we do have seven episodes here of this. Seven different um, adventures. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is the first one because we only start with number two. So maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but um, we have electricity, and then we have some other ones about science 
in the future, which uh, I want to get into after after this, or maybe I will go right into this one because it will be super cool to see just again the speculations about us being 70 years out from magazine from comic from 1956 68 years into the future engineering in the future just wonder uh, all this future speculation I wonder exactly how how right they got it That's a duplicate right there. All right, guys. So let's uh, let's read the story of light. Story of light. Story of light is, of course, about Edison, and then, uh, but it goes all the way back to fire, fire in the cave, man. Ancient history. And the long uh, industrial revolution lead up to Edison's late 1800s invention or uh, discovery of the right material that can last and yield light and withstand the constant expansion and contraction of applying current that heats up a filament to the point of giving black body radiation of in the visible light spectrum which is pretty darn hot if you think about holding a flame up to something long enough to the point where it glows red and orange it's got to get pretty darn hot and it gives off a ton of longer lower energy um, electromagnetic Waves, emissions, photons, in the microwave, then the infrared, before we see any visible, um, before we can tell visually that it's hot. <laughs> Once it hits that point, just like a burner on a stove being orange, you know it's far too hot to touch. We got our buddy Johnny and his big brother Ed. What a good mentor Ed is. Flying around in a helicopter here this time. Hey Ed, we're we're going down. Is anything wrong? Everything's fine, Johnny. We're just landing at Greenfield Village near Detroit here. And so, Johnny and Ed Powers drop in on one of their strangest and most exciting adventures. Isn't this the bright idea you had as a surprise for me? No, I'm saving the bright idea for later, but you'll be mighty surprised at what you see here. Here in Greenfield Village, famous American buildings have been preserved or rebuilt just the way they were when they made history. Look, Henry Ford's old schoolhouse. Let's go in. A real old-fashioned schoolroom. Just the way it looked in 1871 when Ford was a young student here. Old-fashioned is right, and it's dark, too. I'd hate to have to study in this light. Yeah, lighting was pretty bad in those days, Johnny. You know, Johnny, people have always tried to push back the curtain of darkness. Savages used the light of a flaming torch to fight off wild beasts. Not really sure what the hell that is. Is that a dragon with a horse head? In ancient Greece, even the richest man could have only the poorest light. The candles in colonial days were hard to make and had to be used sparingly accordingly. And even as late as 1870, the best light was a flickering gas lamp. 
Yes, an open flame. An open flame was man's only kind of light for thousands of years. And then in 1879, electricity made possible a startling new light, the incandescent bulb. Incandescent, what's that mean? Well, Johnny, you know the way electricity makes the coils in your toaster glow red hot? The hotter a coil becomes, the brighter it glows. And incandescent means glowing white, white hot. We have a little analogy of current and heat. Well, in an incandescent bulb, the coil becomes so hot that it glows white and makes light. But what makes it get hot in the first place? We all know, Johnny, that electric current is really a stream of millions of electrons racing through a wire. If you make the electrons race through a thinner wire, the crowding causes friction. And this friction causes heat. And I get it, friction makes heat. And enough heat makes light. Incandescent light, that is. Right-o, Johnny boy. And it was here in Thomas Edison's workshop that the first practical incandescent electric light bulb was born. Thomas Edison's Menlo Park laboratory right there jeepers the very room where edison made the first electric light i said the first practical johnny you see old tommy edison had known that many scientists before him had produced some sort of light with electricity in 1802 70 years before sir humphrey davy heated metal strips with electricity until they glowed Dimly. Eighteen years later, in 1820, De La Rue's heavy platinum wire in glass tube gave some light, too. Twenty years after that, and a generation later, Sir William Grove made a thick wire coil glow under a water glass for a short time. These early electric uh, experiments used a great deal of electricity, but didn't burn bright enough for long enough to be practical. These failures challenged Edison's genius and gave birth to a new idea. The short, thick materials those fellows used didn't get hot enough to give off much light. Now, if I could use a long, thin filament, it should become white hot. But Mr. Edison, if it's too thin, it'll burn up in a few seconds. Not if we seal it in a vacuum, John. Without oxygen, it can't burn up. So in his effort to make a long, thin filament, Edison tried, Edison tried and discarded platinum and many other metals. He finally decided that carbon would work. If he could find something very thin that could be baked into the carbon filament, nothing was too far-fetched for him to try. Perhaps I can carbonize this bamboo binding. Let's char one of those red whiskers of yours, Mackenzie. Make your hair really glow. If I borrow your sewing, uh, mind if I borrow your sewing thread, dear? We've tried just about everything else. Yeah, you always hear that Edison tried about a thousand different materials. And so, after two years and hundreds of experiments, the great inventor's search ended, strangely enough, in Mrs. Edison's sewing basket. The carbonized thread works. It's been burning 40 hours, Mr. Edison. I think we've got it. If it can burn 40 hours... I can make it last a hundred. Golly, no wonder they called him the Wizard of Menlo Park. Wizard is right. Before his bulb could be put into real practical use, Edison had to devise a whole electric system using a parallel circuit so that you could turn any bulb on or off without affecting the other bulbs. 
So each bulb is its own node. Two nodes are its own branch. All connected, and every bulb is connected to the same positive charge, or across the same positive and negative junction. Um, electromagnetic. Uh, electrovoltaic. Energy. Gap. <laughs> Jumbo generator. He, uh, made it powerful enough to light many hundreds of light bulbs. He invented a mirror, a meter to measure the amount of current that each used, each customer used, because he was not an inventor, but also a, a businessman. He wanted to make money. He invented the fuse to protect the system against overloading, a socket and bulb base to permit quick an easy changing of the light bulbs. That's wild that he invented that, and that still is part of the light bulb system nowadays. Before long, Edison's new kind of light was tremendously popular, brightening the lives of thousands of people in homes, schools, office, factories, stores. Gee, Edison really had some bright ideas, didn't he? Which reminds me, Johnny, to slap you. No, <laughs> which reminds me about my bright idea. I think it's time you went to a university. Me? University at my age? Yes, my boy. The University of Light at Nella Park, Cleveland. You'll see. Golly, it was sure exciting to see the birthplace of today's bulb. Not exactly today's bulb, Johnny, but I'm going to tell you about that on the way. So they hop in their helicopter and give us a history lesson. Edison's 19, 1879 bulb was just the beginning. During the next 25 years, carbonized paper and bamboo filaments were made and using the same amount of current, they burned three times brighter. As the bulb's light increased, its cost decreased. And still the search for improvement went on. To meet the needs of a growing electrical industry, the Edison General Electric Company was organized at Schenectady. Oh, I did not realize. I guess I, I might have heard that in the past, but uh, that Edison's company is GE. Completely forgot about that. So in 1892, it became the General Electric Company. And there at the General Electric Research Labs in 1905, the first great improvement was made. Perhaps I could prevent this early blackening by baking the filament to a high temperature before we put it in the bulb. Dr. Whitney, your heat-treated filament is not only much brighter, but the bulb doesn't blacken so much. Later, more efficient filaments were made, but they were very fragile. They often broke in shipment and couldn't stand the vibration. Until in 1911... After seven long years of constant experimenting, a flexible filament would be stronger. And tungsten would be the best metal to use for that. So, but Dr. Coolidge, nobody has been able to form powdered, powdered tungsten into a solid bar, let alone a wire. I didn't believe it could be done. But a flexible tungsten filament... And look how it stands. Look at how, look how it stands, those jolts, those jars. 1912, two more great advances. If I put an inactive gas, an inert gas like argon inside the bulb, the filament should last even longer. Also, gentlemen, we, if we coil the filament, we can use a much longer filament in the average size bulb and will have brighter light. 
Dr. Lamere, your gas-filled bowl with the cold filament will be the best yet. A few hours later, there it is, Johnny. The GE University of Light. And here we go for a landing. A campus landing. It looks like a university, all right, but is it really one? In a way, it is. People come here from all over the world to learn about good lighting. And scientists gather here to study light. To make it, test it, and improve it. Although each bulb is checked over 480 times during manufacture, sample bulbs are tested daily for brightness, strength, uniform life. Here's an interesting machine, Johnny. The photometer, to measure exactly the amount of light a bulb produces. Looks like a big baseball split down the middle. Say, look, that revolving drum is dropping. Dropping those bulbs right on their heads. That's the torture rack that tests their ability to take punishment. And here... Thousands of sample bulbs are constantly being life-tested. Gee, these are pretty rough proving grounds for light bulbs, aren't they? Well, Johnny, people depend on electric lights, and the bulbs have to be dependable. Is this where the scientists work? Development laboratory here. That's right, in these labs like these, scientists produce the non-sag filament for longer life. A stronger, tipless bulb and brighter coiled coil filaments. Look, Johnny, here's where Marvin Pipkin, the GE scientist, developed the inside frosted bulb in 1925, and just recently, the improved all-white bulb. That's even easier on the eyes. You know, Ed, I'm beginning to see the bulb in a new light. Makes you wonder what the light of the future will be like. They'll be better, Johnny, thanks to the labs like these. Say, Ed, what's that building up ahead? That's the Lighting Institute, where people come to learn about better lighting for their stores, homes, classrooms, and factories. In fact, more than 30,000 people a year come here to Tanella Park to see and study lamps and lighting. No wonder they call it a university. There's a lot to be learned in a place like this. Better lighting for better sight. Better light for better sight is the university's motto. Here's a lighting chart for your desk at home, Johnny. Best, best lighting for home studying is two lamps. The 100 watt bulb, a 6 inch plastic bowl, light colored shade, bottom to diameter 10 inches, a lower edge of shade no more than 15 from the tabletop. Look at this. Two lamps, 26 to 30 inches apart. Hmm. Good lighting for home studying one lamp with one lamp is a three light bulb with a 50, 100, 150 watts, a white glass bowl, light colored shade to let light through. If you're left handed, the lamp should be over to your right. Lamp should be midway between desk front and back of desk. 15 inches to work center. Hmm. You don't want too much distance. Don't want too much direct glare. Or you don't want the light to be too weak. Wow, look at all those bulbs. That's just a sample. General Electric makes thousands of different types and sizes of bulbs for every lighting purpose. And don't forget the many special purpose electric bulbs. You have flash bulbs for high speed photography, infrared lamps 
for for aching muscles <laughs> what infrared lamps for heat lamps for aching muscles germ germicidal tubes to kill the germs in the air the uv tubes didn't realize they knew that back then the amazing black light used in crime detection and forgeries ultraviolet sun lamps that tan like the sun guarantee you'll get cancer years earlier than you would otherwise and then sharp focus bulbs for movie projectors Here the world's largest bulb, 75,000 watts, using enough power to light 83 average homes. Here's the smallest lamp in the world, smaller than a grain of wheat, used for surgical instruments for delicate operations. Say, Ed, what about fluorescent tubes? Oh, I didn't realize they knew about that then either. Do they work the same as incandescent bulbs? No, Johnny, there's a big difference. You see, incandescent bulbs, in these light is produced by electrons squeezing through a long, thin coiled filament, which becomes white hot and bright. <laughs> Here's the filament where we get the electrons all hot and bothered. In our gas, the support wire. The support wire holds the filament in place. Lead wires carry the current through it and around it. The base connects it to the circuit. But in a fluorescent, in a fluorescent bulb tube, light is produced by electrons shooting through a gas filled space. It's complicated, but this will give you an idea. Electrodes sealed in each end. It's got gas in the middle. Wall of tube is coated with phosphorus, fluorescent crystals. Phosphorus, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess phosphorus was the word I was looking for earlier. It's phosphorus that glows. At the starting signal, the, at the light switch, the electrode at one end of the tube shoots electrons through the tube towards the electrode target at the other end. But on the way to the target, the speeding electrons have to crash their way through mercury vapor in the tube. These collisions produce ultraviolet radiations. So it's the mercury vapor gets stimulated and then drops um, they get stimulated so much that they drop back down, emitting a high frequency ultraviolet beyond the blue-violet visible portion of the spectrum. And so this high energy uh, ionizing ultraviolet radiation hits the phosphor coating on the outside of the, 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 the interior of the tube walls. It's coated with phosphorus and they make the fluorescence glow. Okay, so they stimulate the electrons of the phosphorus. Okay, that's cool. That's why it's called fluorescence. It hasn't been used very long, eh, Ed? No, it took many years to make it good enough to, and cheap enough to be popular. First practical fluorescents were sold at Nella Park in 1938. That Edison really started something, didn't he? Whole electrical industry, Johnny. The demand for his electric light led to the great electrical network that today serves our home stores and factories, Johnny boy. Well, I hope your visit to the University of Light <laughs> was enlightening. Sure was. I never knew that lighting was such a science. Yeah, there's a lot more than to lighting than meets the eye. Oh boy. Scientists never stop experimenting, learning, improving, and working.
working towards their goals, moving the sun indoors. All right. I went ahead and picked out a couple of different comics that caught my eye after we did our unboxing, our comic book haul from the Adventures in Science series. And uh, this one you guys are familiar with. We have the our place in space we're going to start off with from 1959. This book is going to follow... I think the general outline of all these comics is that they have a kind of a young boy with a mentor that kind of, you know, shows him around, shows him the state of the art, so to speak. And this is 1959. So this is before, this is right at the cusp of the space race. The opening scene here is our protagonist's in the movie theater, looking at the closing of a science fiction film that said the Earthmen reached for the moon and made it. And made it. Two young Earthmen, in particular Johnny Bowers and his friend Bill, discuss the movie they've just seen for the third time. Sure, it's science fiction now, but so were jet planes and atomic subs. Later in the power's backyard, Johnny's brother, Ed, joins the discussion. Do you really think that we could be missile men someday, Johnny? Why, you boys have been launching missiles for years and don't seem to know it. What do you mean, Ed? A missile is any object thrown at a target. Every time you do this, he throws the ball. You're launching a missile. Catch. Then here goes a guided missile, throws it at a can. Not in today's terms, Bill. Today, guided missile has a special meaning. It's a craft flying above the Earth's surface whose flight path can be guided or changed by interior mechanism. How does it get up there? What guides it? How about satellites? What makes them stay up? Hold it, hold it. First things first, men, let's start off with three principles. Gravity, for one. That's a cinch. Gravity is the force that pulls objects, like this ball, towards the center of the Earth. Fine, Johnny. Now, how about a bike riding demonstration to illustrate the next principle, centrifugal force? Notice, and so Johnny gets on the bike, notice you have to lean inward to overcome the bike's tendency to lean outward when going around in a circle. It's centrifugal force that impels all objects away from the center of the Earth. I guess you could call it the opposite of gravity, couldn't you? Right. In our third principle, is inertia, the property of a body that keeps its traveling in uniform motion on the same straight line, like that ball sailing across the yard. That ball would travel in a straight line if the force of gravity didn't pull it back to Earth. Now getting a satellite into orbit, the trick is to get it going fast enough so that the force of gravity is just cancelled by the centrifugal force. And inertia keeps it going, said Johnny. Right, but to do this, it must be beyond the atmosphere, or air drag will make it fall back to the Earth. Since a space vehicle can't push against the air the way the propeller of an airplane does to get it up to the right speed. So they have a little excerpt from history here. It's powered by a rocket or reaction motor. It was Sir Isaac Newton who observed, and they have Newton here penning, every action produces a reaction, which is equal in force and opposite in direction. 
then they turn to a sprinkler system here, a rotating system. That's how our lawn sprinkler works. It sprays water in one direction, and by this very action, spins itself around in the opposite direction. It's a modern example of a principle known for centuries. So now we're going back in time. If that's so, how come nobody's invented rockets before this? Oh, but they did. But they did. As far back as 1232 AD, the Chinese warred with arrows of fire, gunpowder rockets which hot expanding, in which hot expanding gas blasting downward caused a reaction that sent the head of the body flying upward towards the enemy. The ancient Romans devised a military engine called a ballista, built like a huge, huge crossbow to aim and hurl missiles at the opposition. Then rockets in the form of bursting fireworks have filled the night skies with color and brilliance since the 9th century. And in the War of 1812, the British used ship-launched rockets immortalized in the rocket's red glare of our star-spangled banner to shell Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Roger, I read you loud and clear, Ed, but how do guided missiles actually work? Maybe this TV show will help, Johnny. Holds up a paper. He says, be sure, tonight on TV, be sure to see men in missiles. Then the TV show, I guess, begins. But it wasn't until World, World War II that really powerful artillery rockets were developed, marking the beginning of the age of space. Later that evening, to tell you something about the anatomy of a missile, how it works, its various uses, and also take you behind the scenes at a missile launching. Here is a scale model. The presenter holds up a little rocket. A scale model of the well-known Vanguard, the American rocket whose first satellite is the longest now in orbit, still sending us a wealth of important information. Now we can see here they break down the rockets. Tots. Different components, stages. Now let's look at the guided missile's basic parts. The payload, housed in the nose cone, is the missile's real reason for being. This can be an explosive charge, a separate satellite package, or instruments to record scientific data. Then we have the guidance system. The guidance system masterminds tell the missile where it needs to go. It tells it where to go, knows where it is at any moment, where it should be, Sensitive, precise, it must measure the effects of gravity, upper air currents, and the thrust of the propulsion system below. The internal or accessory power system. The internal or accessory power system provides the necessary power to operate equipment aboard the missile before, during, and after the action of the main propulsion engine. The propulsion system pushes the missile into space. Every rocket contains a supply of fuel and oxidizer or the propellant, and there are several different types, both liquid and solid. The airframe keeps this missile and its parts intact, protecting it under extreme, rapidly changing pressures and temperatures. And the extreme vibrations, the extreme forces that the actual frame of the missile undergoes when it's going, you know, pushing over thousands of miles an hour, getting to the through, punching through the atmosphere. And of course, the faster you go, the more 
the atmosphere, the more air becomes like a solid object you truly are punching through. And so you can imagine the the, the forces buffeting the exterior of these missiles, these any object traveling that far, that fast, that quickly, with that much force behind it. It's um, it's enormous and it's incredible that they're able to engineer, you know, all the way through SpaceX and NASA now nowadays and other institutions, the you know structures that are light enough to be able to lift off the ground and send them into space, but also strong enough to be able to withstand and you know, in SpaceX's case continuously withstand again and again with with um, repeated flights of the same structure, the same hull, um, the just the immense forces that are constantly trying to tear open that spacecraft. Over here it says, Missiles are built for specific uses. You have air to air, from one spacecraft to another, surface to surface, air to surface, surface to air, underwater to surface. And most exciting and complicated of all, the space missile. And here we go over here, we have the Vanguard. Make sure we're in focus here. Okay, the Vanguard was built in three sections or stages, mounted one on top of the other, each carrying its own rocket motor. Now, how do these missiles work? The first stage is the bottom. It's the largest, strongest. It must have uh, thrust for the entire vehicle. The Vanguard in particular here it's got a height of 30, it's got to thrust the vehicle to a height of 38 miles. It's got a pushing, uh, pushing through layers of air at their thickest, where the pull of gravity is its strongest. Second stage, having done its work and burned out, the bottom stage drops off, greatly lightening the load. Now the second stage engine here takes over and pushes the rocket even higher and faster, directing its course, the brain, the control of the entire rocket lies in this second stage. Then the third, at the correct height and position, it drops off, first giving the top third stage a spinning motion to keep it properly oriented on the right path, now far lighter and well above gravity and air friction. The third stage speeds along at 18,000 miles an hour. 18,000 miles an hour. That's incredible. Think about going just 100 miles an hour on the highway. And then multiply that by 18. 180, sorry. By 180. 180 times as fast as most of us have ever gone outside of an airplane, of course. But still, even airplanes only travel six or seven hundred miles an hour, if that. That's almost 36 times as fast as an airplane. Finally, at the 300 mile mark, 300 miles in um, altitude, it ejects. it ejects the payload, a special satellite package, into orbit around the Earth. This satellite sphere, of course, you know, remember this is 1959, they got a Sputnik style satellite still in vogue at the time. That's the cutting edge technology. This satellite sphere, made of many metals, 
is packed with instruments to measure scientific data and transmit it back to Earth. Down here it breaks, uh, looks like it breaks down the internals a little bit. Eventually the satellite falls back into the Earth's atmosphere where it's consumed by the heat of friction. But its knowledge is not lost. Its tiny radio has signaled its discoveries back to Earth by then. The first Vanguard satellite, only six inches in diameter, is expected to stay up there for 200 years. And now let's visit Cape Canaveral, Florida. This is the missile testing grounds. It's about two hours north of me for an actual launching of a spacecraft. Perhaps the most thrilling spectacle of our times, the ground support equipment and facilities on which successful launching depends are almost as complicated as the missiles themselves. On certain missiles, a missile exerciser checks out the control system before the missile is moved to the launch site. A checkout bench a complex system performs a hundred tests on the missile's electronic equipment, then 40 checks on itself to be sure that it's right. The redundancy of, um, of space flight of you know any major established in industry is, is a lot, but with I worked briefly as just a, a low-level technician um, in a aircraft manufacturer's facility for a little while and uh, for a couple of years, and um, it made me realize, it made me feel a lot safer traveling in airplanes because they really do have a redundancy, a a maintenance schedule, a you know a very safe set of parameters within which they um, they allow a vehicle to um, to undergo you know changes in, in wear and tear they test retest retest examine analyze reevaluate re-engineer re test again and again and again um, these spacecraft of course a lot of accidents you know accidents happen but for the amount of flights, I don't think there's been a domestic plane crash in over 10 years now, something like that, maybe even 15. But um, the amount of testing involved in regular commercial aircraft, let alone space flight, is incredible. And it's... Uh, it's sad, but also a testament to to the the engineering and the safety standards. You know, unfortunately, a lot of times safety standards do come about through accidents and just sheer having to learn from vulnerabilities that happen during accidents that are learned about. Um, but uh, you know, it's sad that in the whole Apollo program, the only deaths that ever occurred were in a during a test where they had oxygen. The, the module filled with oxygen, pure oxygen, that was highly flammable, and a spark. A spark, unfortunately, burned the three men alive. Um, of the first, slated to be the first ever men on the first ever Apollo mission. But uh, they had no accidents after that. So, On the launch pad, the missile body stands upright and the nose cone is put on before rolling away the gantries, the steel towers which support the rocket while it's in place. About a hundred feet away, or a thousand feet away, is the blast-proof blockhouse, a control room furnished with intricate instruments manned by highly trained specialists and top government observers. Further down, we have the countdown starts. Men and machines uh, check out the equipment one by one as each vital detail is covered. The backward count continues. Five, four, 
three, two, one, zero, and the firing button is pushed. Burning fuel at a fantastic rate, the rocket moves slowly at first. Then, as the flaming high pressure gases blast out the tail, the tail end at 4,500 miles an hour. Reaction force exerts a giant push and propels the missile into the skies. The minute the TV show ends, boy, did you see that thing take off? Said Johnny's friend Bill. I'd sure like to have been in that blockhouse at the countdown, said Johnny. I've got an idea for you two. Ask Bill if he'd like to learn more about the missiles from a man who helps make them. I don't have to ask. When do we start? So the next morning, we have old Dr. Harris is one of the hundreds of scientists in General Electric's missile program. He'll tell you many interesting things, provided they're not classified. And then after introductions are made, Dr. Harris is saying, Of course, you boys realize that the subject of missiles is so broad and complex, I couldn't cover it in a lifetime. Again, I love this. It goes back into history here. Throughout the country, hundreds of companies, thousands of scientists, engineers, and builders, and even, or if not history, at least it's uh, like a background of building the context, and even some well-educated animals, monkeys, are busily at work, each adding specific skill and knowledge to the growth and development of the U.S. missile program. And you guys, you got to remember here, this is General Electric. The booklet has been, and they even give you a little disclaimer on the back. It's been prepared by the Educational Relations and Support Service with the cooperation of the following departments of the company. The Heavy Military Electronics and Defense Systems Department from New York. The Ordnance Department, which I think ordnance means explosions, explosives. Light Military Electronics, Receiving Tube Department, Aircraft Accessory Turbine, Small Engine, Aircraft Engine Departments, Missile and Space and Vehicle Department in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And then the Flight Propulsion Laboratory Department, in Evandale, Ohio, I guess. That's all to give you an explanation of why Dr. Harris works for GE. So the best I can do is give you a little idea of what some of us are doing at GE. For instance, at Syracuse in New York, Defense Electronics Research, um, Electronics Division Headquarters, pioneer in early radar research we produce and develop advanced electronics systems for the armed forces. Here we developed the guidance systems for the Air Force's Atlas Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or the ICBMs. So accurate, and as interesting as it is, it's also really alarming that this is the 50s and they've only gotten better since, and of course they carry nuclear weapons which themselves have only gotten more powerful since. So accurate, so precise is this radio command guidance system that it sells, it sent Atlas right down the rifle barrel into the bullseye, a target position far off in the South Atlantic, 6,000 miles away. We have the picture of the bullseye up here.
As part of the job, GE trains future missileers, missileers in operation of launching and guidance systems, giving them practical, on-the-spot experience. And Bill says, that's for me. Here in Syracuse, we designed a special sensitive amplifier with a standard 18-foot antenna, picked up, picked up the signals from the Army's deep space probe as it hurled through space over 407,000 miles away. Now let's travel Pittsfield, Massachusetts, home of the Atlas Guidance Tracker, a vital part of the guidance system. Following the missile in its powered phase, the tracker reports the exact position to the guidance computers, signaling the flight controls that direct the missile to the target. High on a rocky mountaintop stands a strange building specially constructed remote, free from vibrations. Here, these delicate, sensitive trackers are assembled and tested under the strictest conditions. Since even invisible dust particles may disturb the fine balance of a tracker, employees in nylon suits must pass, pass through an air bath vacuum cleaner their shoes are cleaned by a power-driven machine, and doors open and lock electronically, one at a time, to keep the filtered air pure and super clean. Fire control equipment is being developed at Pittsfield for U.S. destroyers carrying Tartar, a surface-to-air surface-to-air anti-aircraft missile to track targets moving at supersonic f speed, illuminate them, and supply their position, and, for Navy's Polaris, an underwater to surface operation to commute, compute the sub's position, motions, and target locations so that the missile will be aimed at the target. Now here is Utica, New York, where we concentrate on airborne and space electronics. Do you boys know anything about Sidewinder? Yes, sir. It's an air-to-air -air missile used by the Navy and Air Force and NATO nations. GE's Utica plant produces the infrared guidance device of this aircraft rocket, which is guided by the heat of the target itself. Sidewinder is so accurate, it has shot a flare pot off the wing of a plane at a range of several miles. Wow. Wow. Back in 1943, we began to explore the mysterious infrared ray whose longer wavelengths give it the special properties. Now at Ithaca, we are developing, delving into new and exciting scientific uses. It's interesting to note that at the same time, they're able to use it for non-military applications like satellite imagery of, or um, satellite telescopes, James Webb being one of them. Infrared lets you see through fields and clouds of dust and nebulous um, gases that typically block visible wavelengths. So it, allowed, it opened up at this same time the entire um, depths of the Milky Way that we hadn't been able to detect before. So that and even longer wavelengths like radio, radio astronomy, allow you to, um, infrared, microwave, and radio, allow you to see through deeper, deeper into the universe, allow you to see through um, typically opaque matter that visible light can't exit or enter. 
Um, so it allows you to see into the stellar nurseries, stars concealed by uh, typical, you know, plumes of nebulous matter. And then with microwaves, of course, that was the breakthrough in the late 60s. Using some of these microwave antennas, receivers, scientists um, discovered the static field of low temperature that, that used to be light in infrared and now was stretched across billions of light years out into the much less energetic, longer wavelength microwave region of the spectrum on this end. That became the cosmic microwave background that still is detectable from every vantage point, every direction we turn the telescopes we can detect those so it's um yeah it's fascinating that all at, at the same time and concurrently and in some cases because of science and engineering for military military applications we're also discovering more about the universe itself when you're able to use the technologies to probe the wider um you know, the universe for reasons beyond immediate military gain. Back in 1943, we began to explore the mysterious infrared, I already read that, <laughs> this invisible ray, infrared, which can be measured and transmitted, is at last being put to work to be able to change the TV from a distance. Just kidding. And um, in, in tracking systems, that the enemy cannot detect, at least at the time, I guess. Now let's move on to Evandale, Ohio, where metals and ceramics are being developed and improved to boost, to boost missile performance. New techniques have produced missile components that can stand a flame temperature of 6,000 degrees. Evendale Research has produced improved cases for solid propellants, the simplest and most practical of missile fueling systems. You don't think about the actual metals as being, you know, as crucial of a part of the aircraft, you think, or, or missile um, rockets systems. You think of the whatever fuel they use and, you know, the, the flame, the expellent propo propelling them. You think of all the advanced electronics typically, but, um, yeah, the structure again, the structure itself, it's so interesting how many different varieties of metal alloys there are and how much engineering and just probing into just the nature of you know, even the atomic structure, the chemicals, the chemical structure of metal and how you can have completely different properties just by adding little trace amounts of different metals to, to, uh, to each other. Now they, that's why we have the Bronze Age and that became the Iron Age when you added some things like, I think it was nickel and copper to bronze. I might be wrong there though, but, um, it's amazing how the components, the characteristics, you can go from a, you know, rigid, but um, you can go from something that blunts very easily to something extremely hard as steel. You know, steel itself is even a further iron alloy. And it's interesting watching the Japanese make samurai swords. You can videos on YouTube of watching them replicate it. Modern people replicate the process where they just fold it in on itself. So a samurai sword, and I'm sure there's other things too um, that use this process, but it's so interesting that the samurai sword has something like 30, I don't know, at least tens of thousands, if not 30 to 50 or something, um, thousand layers 
to it because they heat it, heat the metal up, expand it, fold it on itself, pound it down, heat it up, fold it on itself, you know, cool it down, heat it up. They add metal to it and it's alloys, extremely sharp, extremely durable, not brittle. Um, and you, yeah, you can imagine how important of a military advantage that was to civilizations over the last thousands of years since the Bronze Age began. If you both have bronze and then someone discovers iron, which is a far superior, more durable, sharper, less prone to dulling, um, and then, you know, things that don't rust as much, like steel, your equipment is just going to be you're going to be able to outmaneuver. Um, and just like uh, the title of, I think, Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, goes to show you how just one incremental improvement can radically give you an advantage over other civilizations near you. And um, unfortunately, we've always been warlike tribes. I don't think there's ever been a period in all of human history no matter how many hundreds of thousands of years, millions, you want to go back, in which we were completely peaceful. And there might have been small isolated pockets of peaceful coexistence of tribes, but um, we've always had in-group preference, and we've always been belligerent towards out-group potential, you know, exposure to um, not only uh, foreign... Uh, aggression but I'm sure it's an evolutionary advantage to not just sit there with arms wide open <laughs> creed reference because then you'd be welcoming in, welcoming in foreign ideas, foreign diseases potentially depending on how far away they were if you your tribe hadn't been exposed to that um, and so it's it's just fascinating how incremental improvement in technologies, starting with the fire, the vicar, the um, unwitting harness of fire, maybe by just picking up a stick that was in a brush fire and using it to to light a new brush fire. And over millions of years, you learn to harness it and you pass it on through generations, and then you start simultaneously chipping away stone tools. You have those two at your disposal. Undoubtedly, there were many groups of humans, proto-humans, hominids, that went extinct, lines of humans that went extinct because their, their failure to be able to um, successfully adapt and assimilate these technologies in their own tribes in their idea, their belief systems. Yeah, it's just, um, it's fascinating to think what, what allowed modern humans to, uh, be the victors in this evolutionary struggle for existence and what has led all the decisions to adopt new technologies and preserve useful traditional behaviors and um, and now we have science we have this adherence to open-minded truth in the most pure incarnation of what scientists are supposed to be doing that uh, that allow us to go to the moon and probe the universe <laughs> back to our redirecting this guided tour here. Back to our um, breakdown of rocket components. And at the Malta, New York rocket test station, advanced versions of the liquid rocket engine which powered the first stage of Vanguard are being developed and tested. And now you boys can guess, uh, can you boys guess what object this is? 
It looks like a toy electronic tube, Dr. Harris. This toy, <laughs> developed by GE, of course, at Owensboro, Kentucky, of course, is one of our mightiest messengers from outer space. Used as a transmitting tube in Pioneer 4, this tiny object of metal and ceramic continued to send information to Earth long after the satellite passed the moon and entered its orbit around the sun, a distance of more than 400,000 miles, an all-time communications record. I think we're well into the billions of miles at this point with uh, the Voyager spacecraft exiting the solar system as of 2024. To describe our work at Lynn, Massachusetts, I'll tell you about North America's X-15. Only 50 feet long, it's the most advanced rocket to carry a human being and bring him to the fringes of space. Launched from the underside of a B-52 jet bomber, rocket and pilot race 100 miles into the upper atmosphere at a speed of over 3,600 miles an hour. Their man and machine record, record the effects of extreme altitude flight for future space voyagers. Again, this is in 1959. This is all this cutting-edge technology. The X-15 launched from the bomber by a reaction motor? Like a regular rocket? Yes, said Dr. Harris. And also an auxiliary power unit developed by GE. I love the plugs. Developed by GE to produce all the power necessary to keep the pilot alive and bring the research plane back to Earth. You see, Johnny, a rocket engine provides only propulsion. You need a separate source of power after the engine has died out to keep the pilot warm and operate the guidance systems and the communication and recording equipment and operate the speed brakes, the landing flaps, and controls that bring man and machine back safely. Already, GE, GE scientists are working on new power sources that stagger the imagination. Such a device needs no fuel, has no moving parts, and produces electricity forever. Hmm. A last quick trip to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where as part of a science industry, where as part of a science industry government team, GE works on missile re-entry vehicles for the U.S. Air Force. Housing the payload, we have our... We have our, um, I guess our payload up here. It's about to be installed on top of the rocket. Oh, a nuclear warhead. The re-entry vehicle must be made of materials to shield it from the fantastic heat generated as it plunges back into the atmosphere from outer space. From a peak height of close to a thousand miles. Test re-entry vehicles, re-entry vehicle materials and shapes for heat resistance, GE scientists devised a shock tunnel in which experiments, specimens are exposed to hypersonic shock waves and a large air arc that produces temperatures up to 12,000 degrees. When a test is, vehicle is fired, missile engineers on Earth need a complete record of its performance. How can they get this information out of space? The vehicle, the vehicle's radio relays to Earth all important data on the environment encountered, as well as on the vehicle's own performance, then back up this information. The vehicle also carries this missile data recovery capsule Developed in Philadelphia, this electronic messenger records flight information. 
shortly before re-entry vehicles re-entry vehicles plunges into the ocean the capsule is thrown free on striking the water it sends radio signals released dye markers releases dye markers then on striking the water it sends radio signals releases dye markers detonates a bomb and activates a flashing light planes and ships alerted to its location find and recover the capsule which is later opened to yield its tape recorder information again interesting that it's a uh, on this advanced nuclear technology and they're recording the data on actual tape, analog tape. Recent capsules have also carried cameras, obtaining the first photos from outer space of the Earth and Sun, taken from a traveling space vehicle. Life support. Maintaining life in outer space is an important study here. Mice, monkeys, and man all must be protected with a special life cell with an internal temperature of around 75 degrees. GE is continually preparing for the ultimate goal, manned interplanetary flight. For example, to protect our spacemen against the enormous forces of gravity in takeoff and reentry, he may travel in an individually tailored contoured seat molded from a plaster cast of his own body in flight position. Wow, well, I never knew that. I guess that's how I never really thought about the, the uh, comfort of the seats that they have to be pushed into with all that force. So, as the visit ends, thanks, Dr. Harris. It was a great guided tour, said Billy. That was only a quick look, but I think you've gotten the idea. We're a large team pooling our skills and knowledge and knowledge to launch America into space as swiftly and as mightily as we can. I guess missiles are the most powerful weapons in history. They are. Already they've increased our knowledge of the universe. They've helped us to find new techniques of weather observation, new methods of cosmic ray studies, new communications. And in the future, who knows? Perhaps we'll be taking monorail trains and air taxis to the nearest spaceport, ready to take off for Mars or Venus. On launching pads, and this is before we even knew Venus had a, a hostile atmosphere. On the launching pads, ground crews will service and refuel the ships. Into the space liner will go. Then the countdown, three, two, one, zero. With a mighty roar, we're off on our own and interplanetary transport. Off on a visit to another world. Maybe not tomorrow next week or next year, but hey, GE is working on it today. So we just read our place in space. I might I might edit them into the video in a different order here, but um, this Adventures Inside the Atom, the 1948 comic, I think it might be the oldest of all these comics we got too. This is the one that got me, it's kind of the gateway comic here, that got me uh, fanatically browsing eBay. In the adventure of my own that ended up ended up with me purchasing all of these. Again, it was about averaged to about $5 a piece, but there is 24 of them, so started adding up. I had to, <laughs> I had to 
hit pause there after a while. I think I got most of them, though. <laughs> I think I got most of them. So these, um, these two about the atom. These are the only ones about the atom specifically. So these are what we're going to read right now. And then after that, maybe we'll do the story of light and get into uh, electricity around us in the um, six or seven other, other, um, what do you call them? The six or seven others in that series about electricity in particular. So let's put those aside and let's start with Adventures Inside the Atom. Story of Nuclear Energy. Again, I think this is the oldest one of the bunch here. So, uh, 1948. It says on the cover here, All energy has always come from out of this world. The far-off sun has given us indirectly the stored energy of coal and oil. The living energy of plants and animals. And of humans, too. Today, scientists have found the source of the sun's strange and wonderful energy locked in the heart of the atom. And these scientists are releasing that atomic energy to serve us all in the future as a source of almost unlimited power. Here is the thrilling story of man's greatest adventure into the unknown. In his discovery of nature's greatest secret. Starts up here with the modern miracle of atomic power is the climax of a never-ending search for knowledge. It began more than 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece. yelling at Democritus. You're a fool, Democritus. All men know that this piece, this gold, is one solid piece. No, I believe that everything is made up of tiny particles we cannot see. And, uh, I actually heard that Democritus was wasn't the originator of that idea, but he was the most famous person uh, whose, of whose writings, I guess, that we still have. Mind not those doubters. Master, tell me more. All things around us, says Democritus, trees and stones and even our bodies are made of building blocks smaller than anything you can imagine. I call them atoms. It was, I think it was a tomos, a tomos in Greece, Greek. And a few years later, Aristotle added an idea of his own. Aristotle says it must be that all the thousands of things on earth are combinations of certain basic elements. For centuries after that, men called alchemists struggled to find the combination of elements which would make precious gold. King saying, make me gold, wise man, and I will give you a kingdom. And then he says, watch as I stir this secret mixture, sire. Watch. And then take that for wasting the king's time. He gets beaten for a failed experiment. How's that for motivation? 
and every mixture failed to make gold, but alchemists kept on trying. Until in 1808, a Quaker, a Quaker school teacher, John Dalton, suggested, with all our knowledge of chemistry, we cannot change the atoms of other elements into gold because gold itself is a basic element. The atoms of each element are different from the atoms of all other elements. Half a century later, between 1850 and 1900, scientists tried to explore inside the atom. Perhaps the atom, which we have thought the smallest possible particle, is itself made up of parts. And here in these... These parts are held together by electrical attraction. But there must be spaces between these atoms, these parts inside the atoms. In 1913, the Danish scientist Niels Bohr combined these theories into Why Dr. Bohr? It's like a solar system within each tiny atom. Electron planets whirling around this nucleus as the sun. Gosh, Ed, you sure make all that history seem real. There's old Johnny and his big brother Ed again. Um... Johnny, Ed, these pictures at the, this exhibit helped. Now you know we've been working along on the atom for a long time, Johnny boy. So that's what an atom looks like. Then we have a model with a positive sphere surrounded by concentric circles of negative, uh, bands with negative spheres on them. Well, of course no one has ever seen one, Johnny. After all, that atom, uh, an atom is so small that if you could count atoms from the year one until today, shows a progression of a baby to an old man, counting 124, 125, 126, 36 billion six hundred seventy eight million one hundred and twelve thousand five hundred ninety nine thirty six billion six hundred seventy eight million one hundred and twelve thousand six hundred <laughs> you wouldn't have enough atoms to cover the head of a pin that's uh, quite the image thirty six billion on a pinhead Wow. And if that makes your head spin, imagine the size of the nucleus where the power of the sun is locked. The nucleus is only one million millionth of the size of a whole atom, the size of a bunch of grapes in the 267,000 square miles of Texas. Not so fast, Ed. First the nucleus was like a sun, then grapes. It's, it's all clear as grape juice. Here, Johnny, I'll make it easier. Now, in this model of a nitrogen nucleus... Hey, Ed. Hey, Ed. How do you know this atom is nitrogen? It doesn't say. You can always tell the kind of atom by the numbers of plus electrical charges or protons in the nucleus. Here, count them. Johnny counts seven protons. Yeah, you're right, nitrogen. It says one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten. Atomic numbers. Those are the atomic numbers of hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. 
You see, each of the 92 elements in nature, from the smallest to the largest, is given an atomic number equal to its number of protons. Eight pluses. This must be oxygen, but Ed, where are the black... What are the black balls mixed up in there? Those are neutrons. They are extra weights without any electrical charge. See, an atom's number is the number of protons in an atom's weight is the number of protons and neutrons. So the atom is defined by the protons, and then the number of neutrons within each atom, within each group next to each group of specific number of protons in that element, can vary. The neutrons can vary, but the protons cannot without making a new element. So we here have oxygen with 8 protons and 8 neutrons, making a total weight of 16. But that number 8 can fluctuate. And in fact, as the atoms get larger, or the groups of protons grow, the number of neutrons very often exceeds the number of protons. So whereas, whereas you have the same number of neutrons and protons in oxygen there, 8 and 8, typically, iron has 26 protons while having 30 neutrons. Gold has 79 protons, but 118 neutrons, making for an atomic weight of 197. Then uranium has 92 protons, but 146 neutrons. And that's why on uranium in particular, typically, on average, the larger the atom, the more nucleons they have, protons and neutrons are called nucleons, the more unstable the atom is because the strong force, the strong atomic force, acting like glue, holding and binding the protons together, and the neutrons, given that they're like charges, their, their electrostatic force wants to repel them away, but the strong force is many magnitudes stronger than the electric force. However, once you get a clump of protons, pure positive charges too large, like in these larger atoms, their nuclei become unstable, and sometimes they split. So Johnny says, you mean that if I took out some of those pluses, it would change the atom to another kind? That's easy. Easy, is it? Remember alchemists worked for centuries, but couldn't take three pluses out of 82 lead to get the revered gold with 79 protons. But strangely enough, some elements change by themselves. Antoine Henri Henri Becquerel found found one of these in 1896. Madame Curie, I can't understand it. This uranium ore gives off some strange kind of ray. Madame Marie Curie says, "Please, Professor, let me experiment with it." Between the two of them, they discovered that certain elements are radioactive that they shoot off some of their protons. Here, I'll show you. It shows them here. And, uh, I get it, it's shooting off plus charges. Exactly, let's suppose this sparkler is radioactive or hot uranium. You see, 92 uranium loses plus charges until it becomes 88 radium. Johnny says, oh, the sparklers stopped burning. Yes, and even after centuries, radioactive elements do burn out too. Each 88 radium nucleus loses plus charges until it finally becomes 
82 lead, a stable or cold element. This whole process is called natural transmutation. Why it happens and why it stops, no one really knows, but it's an important part of our story, you see. It shows atoms on the scale, losing protons, getting progressively lighter. English scientist, sir, I'm just uh, going back to Marie Curie real quick, I heard that her stuff, her lab equipment today is still radioactive from handling and being uh, around all that uranium. An English scientist, Sir Ernest Rutherford, found an important use for radioactive elements in 1919. You mean, Sir Ernest, that you can use the particles coming from the radium? Yes, they are my bullets, which I use to bombard other atoms. You can never tell what will happen next. Gallien, what did happen? Something surprising, Johnny. Rutherford plastered a proton on a 7-nitrogen nucleus and made it 8-oxygen, the first artificial transmutation of elements. And in California in the early 1930s, gentlemen, Dr. Lawrence here has chipped a proton out of a nucleus with his cyclotron. That's, uh, what they used to call particle accelerators. Here it is, a three million volt atomic cannon that shoots much more powerful proton bullets than radium does. It will be valuable in many new experiments. Wow, look at that, 300 million volts. Yes, with giant electrical atom smashers like these, Scientists have achieved the dreams of the alchemists. They've made gold, changed elements, even created new elements never before seen, not seen in nature. And then, of course, another little general electric plug there. 300 million volt synchrotron being built by none other than General Electric. The Betatron, 100 million volts, cyclotron, synchrotron, Betatron, cyclotron, synchrotron. But the greatest wonders were yet to come. The scientists who were plastering and chipping atoms were getting closer and closer to the energy locked in the atom nucleus. Men have always used energy that came indirectly from the sun, but in 1905, Albert Einstein saw in every speck of dust here on Earth a possible source of that same energy. This man said, if matter could be destroyed, energy would be created in its place. What nonsense, Albert writes. What nonsense? Isn't that what happens when I burn this match? Of course not. That's only a chemical reaction. According to this formula of Einstein's, energy equals mass mass multiplied by the speed of light squared, destroying completely the atoms of this matchstick would melt all the snow in Switzerland. I love those analogies. They really do help put the sheer volume, the enormity of the energy in the small volume, the small mass, in its proper place, in the context. But luckily, some scientists didn't laugh, and for 33 years they tried to destroy matter and release energy. 
in 1938 while Otto Hahn and Fritz Straussmann were trying to plaster protons on the nucleus of the 92 uranium. Well, doctor, we failed again, but how did the 56 barium get in with uranium? Strange, Herr Osman, very strange, I wish, and Dr. Meitner were still here working with us. It's my best German accent there. <laughs> and in Denmark, when Dr. Meitner heard of the experiments, no wonder Dr. Meitner is so excited. She thinks perhaps the uranium actually fissioned or split in two. There's Dr. Meitner walking into the Danish physicist Niels Bohr's office. When an atom fissions, it splits into fairly similar chunks, similar sized chunks. This is generally what happens total weight of the protons and neutrons when split into its own distinct atoms produces a massive quantity of energy. Of course, each individual atom wouldn't produce an amount of energy that would be detectable to humans, but again, 36 billion atoms fit on the head of a pin. So if you had that that energy multiplied by 36 billion, you can imagine it would indeed melt all the snow in Switzerland. But the barium and krypton left by the split way less than the original uranium. Could that mean the sum of the parts don't add up to the whole? Working on Lisa Meitner's clue, Niels Bohr organized further experiments before leaving for America and soon after at the George Washington University. Dr. Bohr has just heard that there is now proof the splitting, that the splitting uranium destroyed mass and energy must have been released. We must check further. Einstein was right. Come, let's try it in our own lab. In many experiments that followed, scientists in America discovered that, strangely enough, only a certain kind of uranium split. Kind of uranium? Didn't you tell me all uranium had the same number of protons? 92 protons? Yes, Johnny, but for some unknown reason, about one out of every 140 uranium atoms has three less neutrons. Instead of weighing 238, it has a mass of only 235. This U-235 is the only kind that splits. Shows the common kind, which is 99% of uranium rocks and metal that we find in the earth when we dig it up from uranium deposits natural uranium deposits, but um, there are trace amounts of U-235, it turns out. And I learned that uh, there's a pit in Africa that is actually radioactive. And it has so much uranium that even with the trace amounts of U-235 in it, it adds up to enough to actually produce its own heat source. I get it, said Johnny. You need U-235 to split and to release energy. That's right, Johnny. But we still didn't have usable energy, you see. The atomic cannons used up more power than they produced from splitting atoms. Golly, that's like spending dimes to get nickels. Right, Johnny. But they discovered that when each uranium atom split, it produced something else. 
something new, some new neutron bullets, that, hey, couldn't they use those new bullets to split other atoms? Smart boy, Johnny. Now they didn't need those cannons at all. They could set up a chain reaction. A chain reaction? What's that? Here, I'll show you. First, well, we'll make believe these match heads are U-235 atoms. Now we'll arrange them like this, so that each one will light or split two others. And then... When the first match starts a chain reaction, look. With U-235 atoms, after one second, two million split. One one thousandth of a second later, forty billion split. And before you can bat an eye, nine hundred and trillion, and faster and faster and faster. You can hardly imagine the power of the sudden release of energy in uncontrolled change react chain reactions. And here they have a, uh, a guy about to drive a golf ball. And it says the explosive force of U-235, the size of a golf ball, equals explosive force of 100 freight cars full of TNT. Wow, so that's how the atom bomb works. Yes, but as recently as 1940, it seemed impossible to get enough pure uranium-235 to maintain a chain reaction. And here's why. It was almost impossible to separate the U-235 from U-238 because they both are the same element. But we finally found a way to do it on a small scale. At this rate, it'll take scientists centuries to separate enough U-235. There's only one outfit big enough to handle this job. Someone going to Roosevelt. Mr. President, Professor Einstein asked that his letter be, letter be delivered to you personally. Probable that a nuclear chain reaction can be set up vast amounts of power generated. Hmm. So, this is the beginning of the Manhattan Project here. And the President of the United States brought together history's largest combination of the fabulous resources of the world's richest nation, the know-how of America's great business leaders, the knowledge of the world's most brilliant scientists, an army of skilled industrial workers, the security of military power, to build a tremendous new industrial city to separate U-235 from its chemical twin, U-238. Johnny, teamwork can do anything. General Electric and other companies did their share of the impossible by building many special kinds of electrical equipment in record-smashing time. And soon in the multi-million dollar plant at Oak Ridge, enough pure U-235 was separated to start a chain reaction. Gee, all that just to make a bomb? To end the war quickly, no effort was too great, Johnny. And we tried to produce other atomic, other another source of atomic power. We found out it could be done on December second, nineteen forty-two, in a secret experimental lab under the Stag Field, the grandstand in Chicago, under the bleachers, in a building underground. They set up the first ever controlled chain reaction and were creating plutonium. What's plutonium? 
It's a new man-made element, Johnny, made from those plentiful U-238 atoms we had thought useless. We have a little diagram in a reactor of uranium The chain reaction of U-235 changes U-238 atoms into 94 plutonium So you have 235 splits, bombards U-238 Which It's more complicated than that, but um, produces plutonium and the easier to separate plutonium can maintain chemical chain reactions just like U-235. And so at Hanford, Washington, across the country, Uncle Sam built a new, a great new kind of plant. It's now operated by General Electric for the Atomic Energy Commission. And they were manufacturing plutonium in giant reactors. 403,000 acres. What's that reactor you're talking about, Ed? They're factories where we can control the chain reaction of splitting atoms, like this. Now he sets up the same experiment with matches diverging, except he leaves the stems of the matches long enough so that they burn at a slower rate. Notice how the wooden matches, matchsticks slow down the chain reaction of the match heads. In a reactor, uranium rods are separated by graphite, known as neutron poisons. They absorb the neutrons so that they don't create too many chain reactions too quickly. Neutrons joining 238 to form plutonium. Uranium rods, graphite blocks, neutrons slowed right there. Stopped by graphite right there. And reactor uranium rods are separated by graphite to slow down the neutrons. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't the reactor finally explode anyway? No, because just as this wet blotter can prevent the fire from spreading. Adjustable control rods in the reactor absorb neutron bullets, and the more blotting rods, the less fission. So they have control rods scattered throughout that they can either um, pull out or put back in to, to specifically control the rate of chain reactions. Here, let's work this model reactor. The graphite slows the rate of fission, and adjusting these control rods regulates the amount of fission. And here's how General Electric operates the reactor at Hanford. U-235 fissions controlled with rods. They have someone, they have machines able to precisely raise them up or lower them down. Ordinary uranium, U-235 and U-238 mixed is the fuel for the reactor. New man-made plutonium is removed from the ashes, quote-unquote ashes, and plutonium is shipped out. In both laboratories and production plants, safety is assured in many ways. And the deployment office here at the plant. Fine, fine. Now you'll have an important training before you're allowed to work in the plant. All these rules must be obeyed at all times. No exception. You don't have to worry with these thick protective walls between you and the hot stuff inside. These sensitive instruments would warn long before the danger point was reached. The result, folks living near the um, living near the reactors are in no danger at all, and workers are as safe as in their homes. Unless you're handling the demon core, and then 
you uh, need to really watch the possibility of a prompt reaction that's going to radiate your body with neutrons and gamma rays. But uh, that's another story. And look here, Johnny. General Electric's mechanical hands designed to handle radioactive materials by remote control. Gee, he's writing from way over there. But Ed, we still haven't gotten around to useful atomic power. Well, you have to admit, we're getting close. Einstein's theory and his tremendous energy, the tremendous energy released in each nucleus split and our controlled chain reaction, now for the last step. We're building the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory near Schenectady, New York, where we will learn to use atomic fuel. Construction site up there. Here they say, we expect to use its tremendous heat energy to generate electrical power, perhaps like this. Heat from the reactor turns water into steam in a heat exchanger. Conducting rods are put into the water vessels, create steam, and then that just, the power system operates like a traditional steam engine from that point. Steam turns the turbines, spins shafts of generators, which creates electrical power. Run along electrical lines, input into the grid to run cities. And then Johnny, Johnny's imagination gets to work. Sure, how about all those other things? Uh, atomic disintegrator guns and atomic flying machines on my back, atomic rockets, Atomic pills to run our automobiles for years. <laughs> Hold on, Johnny. You've been reading too many comics. <laughs> That's funny. Without getting fantastic here, there are enough wonderful things possible. With atomic energy, we can make new forms of plant life. Use radioactive tracers to help cure disease, change elements, and create new ones. Perhaps power big ships and submarines. And probably, probably generate tremendous electrical power. Someday there's going to be enough power for everybody everywhere. And they're loading boxes of uranium to Alaska, Iceland. Iron? I don't know where that is. Golly, I can see it now. Got people up north. In igloos. With all the modern day appliances. Fans. TVs, toaster, popping toast down. Lamps, street lights, chimneys. You're lucky, Johnny, facing a wonderful future. I knew it, Ed, but now I understand it a lot better. Things to come. That was the 1948 Adventures Inside the Atom. Now, I think this might be maybe the same comic, but just updated. This one was written three, eight, eight years later. Hmm. Yeah, it kind of is the same, but uh, let's see how different it is. The atomic energy exhibit begins here, Johnny, with a look into the past. 
Same little intro excerpt. The modern miracle of atomic power is the climax of a never-ending search for knowledge. It all began more than 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece. You're a fool, Democritus. You see this bracelet? It's one solid piece? No, I believe that all matter, even gold, is made up of tiny particles we can't see. Democritus. It's just, yeah, they just reanimated uh, this. Aristotle, alchemists. Dalton discovering the first evidence that individual elements combine in distinct ratios always consistently, so they must be atoms. Next 50 years, they try to explore the atoms. They link it with electricity and discover that electrical charges, negative charges, are surrounding a positive nucleus, or at least they're mixed up until early 1900s, Niels Bohr and others realized that there must be a dense central point, positive of positive charge, surrounded by a more, a larger volume of electrical charges, uh, negatively charged. And then he says, yeah, we get a model of the solar system. This time we have individual spheres representing the nucleons. Then he gets to the 36 billion atoms on a pinhead. And then this time instead of grapes in Texas, the nucleus is analogized to analogized to the uh, to a raspberry in the Grand Canyon Becquerel, Madame Curie, experimenting with uranium, a sparkler demonstration. Rutherford, splitting the first atom, knocking a, was it a proton out or a neutron? Cyclotron. Those were typically just the size of, uh, you know, just tens of feet across instead of miles in circumference, like modern particle colliders are. We got Einstein, DMC school. And that translating into just how much energy might result from the splitting of uranium into krypton and barium or other elements. Lisa Meitner consulting with Niels Bohr and saying that, oh, well, we might be able to split one atom or use the neutron emission of radioactive material like uranium to split other atoms if they're densely packed packed uh, densely enough together and down here the the analogy I saw in the uh, unboxing video one tablespoon of uranium 
You can hardly imagine the power of a sudden release of energy in an uncontrolled chain reaction. One tablespoon of uranium has the same amount of potential energy as 750 tons of coal. A ton being about 2,000 pounds, so 1,500 thousand, so I guess 1.5 million tons of coal, pounds of coal. And the speed of a prompt chain reaction that nuclear bombs are designed to detonate from are, uh, how they're designed to detonate is instantaneous. It is within millionths of a second that all that is released. Instead of just a steady, a steady controlled chain reaction that, like in a nuclear reactor, that just gives off a, a steady flow of heat. Bombs are meant to meant to yield the entire um, potential output of all that nuclear energy all at once instantaneously and uh, that's why they're so devastating and then now they've updated this with uh, the atomic sub is now a reality. The atom sub, capable of speeds of over 23 miles an hour, is designed to stay submerged for thousands of miles. An atomic power plant, similar to the one designed for the U.S. Navy submarine Seawolf, is being tested in the world's largest steel sphere. A steel sphere at West Milton. New York. The first atomic electricity for home and industrial use has been made available from byproduct energy associated with this project. Associated with that project. The first atomic energy. That's amazing. The first atomic energy. want to thank all you guys for watching so it's been a, a fun little read through a couple of these comics I enjoyed it let me know if you want to continue the series and um, thanks to everyone who helps support the channel through patreon paypal and the other avenues to help thanks for all your love guys and i really appreciate you watching if you liked it subscribe hit like it helps youtube know that you enjoyed it, and uh, you'll see me in your recommendations more often, if that's your thing. <laughs> All right, take care, guys.
Skoðið einnig gefandi.